which seems to go against the scripture where God says God desires all men to be saved. Yes, and well, to come to the knowledge of the truth. He desires all men to be saved. Why aren't all elect? Yes. Doesn't make sense. So scripture has to work with scripture. Mm -hmm. It has to work hand in hand with scripture. That's right. So there is a spiritual death. We are separated from God. What really causes that? Is it our sin? Is it our evil nature? What do the scriptures say? It is enough under the definition of our de depravity to say that we cannot persuade God to provide redemption for us. If God doesn't choose to provide redemption for us, we're, we're lost forever. It's enough to say that we cannot get rid of our sinful nature. There's no chemical, no bleach we can put inside our souls to make ourselves pure. We are sinful and we are dead in, in sin in the sense we cannot uh, separate ourselves from it. And if God did not give us foreknown persuasion of circumstances, we could not choose God. We wouldn't even want to be saved. We wouldn't even think of it. But So in, in a real sense, we're totally dead in our sins, even though we have a free will. In the sense we're separated from God, yes. But to go beyond that and say, as Augustine did, furthermore, the sinner is incapable even to incline toward the good. Now, I use the analogy of a prisoner in a jail cell and he cannot unlock the door. He has no key, he's locked in. He can't set himself free. But there's a window and there's some bars, he can't get out through the window, but he can look out through the window and say, please get me a lawyer. Or here I am, please tell my family where I am, please. He can ask for help. He can't set himself free, but he can plead for help. And that's pleading to God. Mm -hmm. But that pleading to God, unless God created circumstances in our lives that brought us to the very bottom, yes. we wouldn't plead for he God. He finds himself in the jail cell and he says, I need help. Uh, so in the jail cell, he's at the end of his rope, therefore he's pleading. But if he was spiritually dead in the sense that Augustine said, he would be content with the jail cell and wouldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. Someone has to come and run down the list of cells and say, I think I'm going to set this prisoner free. I'm like, you're out. Mm -hmm. Go outside. But if the person wasn't... And, and you stay in your jail. The person wasn't in prison. They're going mm -hmm. about life on their own, just happily go lucky. They're never going to want yes. to call out to a, a pirate. And we pirate. often hear this called unconditional election. But uh, we need to know the flip side of that is unconditional reprobation, which means God doesn't choose you. You're out. Forget it. Mm -hmm. Now, Romans chapter and 7. And by the way, this can be rather discouraging to evangelism. Now, a lot of people influenced by Augustine are great evangelists. I mean, you could n name some that are wonderful evangelists. But still, if you really, t if they would follow their theology very logically, they would say there's no point in pleading with sinners to repent because they can't do that. They have to be regenerated first, so I should only be preaching to those that are already regenerated, not to the unregenerate. And so let God regenerate people, and when I see they're regenerated, then I'll preach to them. That would be really consistent, but of course they don't do that, and thank God they don't. It's great when people are not always thoroughly consistent with their theology. Mm -hmm. Now let's look at Romans chapter 7, verse 9, because this has a, a great bearing in it. What really causes our spiritual death? Is yes. it our, our sinful nature, mm -hmm. or is it something else? Generally, those who would agree with Augustine that um, the, spinner, the sinner is spiritually dead in the sense of cessation of function also define man's lostness as from the womb to the tomb. We're spiritually dead from the womb to the tomb. In sin my mother conceived me. Yes. And uh, so we need to check whether that is true. Is this spiritual death understood as separation from God as opposed to all of the spiritual functions being negated? Does that apply from the conception in the womb or from birth or from the moment when a sinner having a sinful nature allows that sinful nature to act and sins. Let's see what scripture says. Quoting Romans 7 verse 9.
Paul is describing his own experience in the earlier part of his life when he was a child. And here's what he said about the period of his life when he was a child. Once I was alive, apart from the law. When Paul said he was alive, obviously he's not referring to being physically alive, that's taken for granted. He was alive, yes. He means he was alive spiritually as a child. Apart from the law, meaning when he was incapable of understanding the possibility of moral culpability or righteousness. He was a child unaware of such things. So Paul does not say he was spiritually dead from the womb. He is actually saying he was alive at that early period of his his existence. So in his early years, he was spiritually alive before he knew the difference between right and wrong, before Mm -hmm. he could really choose (coughs) to do good or to do evil. He's saying, during that time, I was spiritually alive. He had not, it was not yet, not yet to be described as spiritually dead. Well, he goes on to say, but when the commandment came, meaning when the commandment came and Paul understood it, he perceived the possibility of disobeying that commandment and becoming morally culpable as a result, or the possibility of honoring the commandment, obeying it. And he said, when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. What kind of death? Spiritual death. So at that point in time, he was separated. Became separated from God. From God, God yes. in a spiritual sense, because he was at a point where he knew he had a choice between <clears throat> choosing between good and evil, and our nature, when it realizes that, says, I'm going to choose. Sometimes referred to as a, an age of accountability or a moment of accountability. So the key words here are sprang to life. Yes. What sprang to life? Sin sprang the to sin life. The sin nature was activated. So it was latent. Our sinful nature, it's in us because Psalm 51 verse 5 says, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Mm -hmm. So we've got a sin nature that's always in us. It was passed down from Adam. We found that out. That's what Mm -hmm. we call it, the sinful nature or Adamic nature. Mm -hmm. But what Paul is saying is that it was latent. It was not put into effect. It, It was a gear that was in neutral. It had not yet done something that caused him to die in that spiritual sense. And what sprang it into life was when we as children at a very young age know the difference between good and evil. Honey, don't do that. That's wrong. That's wrong. That's Mm -hmm. evil. And instantly at that point in time, our evil, our sinful nature kicks in and says, I'm going to choose to do what is wrong. It reacts negatively to a commandment and chooses to disobey. So sin springs into life at that point. Every person is like that, so we're all sinful, separated from God. I would say the sinful nature is activated, or as Paul says, springs to life and causes us to sin. Right. Good. The sinful nature is there first, then the deed of sin follows. Now, it seems to be a contradiction. How could he have a sin nature that's latent there, waiting to spring to life, and still be spiritually alive. That's what Paul is saying. And it's evident that these two things are not contradictory. So a person can be conceived with an Adamic nature, a fallen nature, and yet be alive in a spiritual sense until the moment when A commandment comes, the person understands it and chooses to disobey it. Now, the sinful nature guarantees that will happen. Now, what we're emphasizing is that it's not our sinful nature that separated us from God. It's the sin that we choose to do. Yes. Let's see if that is backed up by other scriptures. Romans 3.23. Let me see if I quote it correctly. For all are conceived with an Adamic nature and as a result fall short of the glory of God. No, that's not what it says. Hypothetically, Paul could have said that. And it certainly would have suited certain people's theology a lot better if he had. That is not what Paul said. He said, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So it's the (coughs) actual choice of sinning that separates us from the glory of God. It's not our nature. At the moment, the Adamic nature is allowed to manifest itself in an act of disobedience. Then and only until, and not until then, does a person become separated from God, hence dead 
in the sense of the separation factor. How about other scripture? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, the verse we started with. See if I quote it correctly. As for you, you were dead by virtue of having a sinful nature. No, doesn't say that. Paul said, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. So it's when you sin, that's when you became dead. Not You were not dead because of your sinful nature. Yes. You were dead because of the sin choices you made. You've got a free will. You chose. As a result, you are separated from God. Don, this has tremendous bearing uh, on children. I mean, yes. If you adhere to Augustine and you agree that the cessation of function is the only way necros can be used, and therefore we have no free will, then from the womb to the tomb we are sinful. If a child, either born in the, uh, dying in the womb. Miscarriage. Miscarriage. <clears throat> If they're sinful, then they're not of the elect. That's right. Uh, with this understanding of a cessation, what Paul is saying right here, I was alive apart from the law. This would say that a child, a miscarried uh, person who uh, dies in the womb, therefore God is allowed to bring them to himself because they were never separated. Mm -hmm. Now, there are those who would say, hey, uh, according to scriptures, uh, that uh, if, my, if I'm saved, my child is going to be sanctified through that as well. So that applies great for those who are believers, but it doesn't do much for a Muslim woman who miscarries, a Hindu woman who miscarries, uh, all these others. And so this brings tremendous life on a, on a global scale with what God is doing, constantly overruling in the sovereign events of mankind. Yes and in what's going on. I'm sure there is a percentage of the number of children who have died. We're going to learn that in our next focus. Yes. Who wins in the end? Yes. But right now, let's go to one more passage. Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2, again, emphasizing it's not our Adamic nature that separates us from God, it's our sin. Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your Adamic nature has separated you from your God. No, doesn't that's say not, that. That's a deliberate misquote. But hypothetically, it could have been written there. Something like that could have been said. Instead, the prophet wrote, "Your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden your." his face from you so that he will not hear. So there again, it's the separation factor and the separation begins when sin happens. And when we choose, we know the difference between good and evil and we, our Adamic nature springs to life yes. and says we're choosing <clears throat> evil. Yes.